And welcome everybody to participatory design of a basic income for people with disabilities, the Canada Disability Benefit. This session is brought to you with the generous support of the conference sponsors, the Gerald Huff Foundation for Humanity, Humanity Forward Foundation, Aid Kit, and Steady. Before we begin, I would like to give a brief overview on how to use Crowdcast. If you would like to submit a question to the speakers, ask, <laughs> uh, please post in the ask a question section down at the bottom of the window. Um, and you can also vote on questions already posted by other attendees. So those ones will get our attention a little bit more. And it'll also help us focus on the questions that you're most interested in. Next, there's the chat box uh, where you can hold side conversations and it's where we'll post any links and supplemental information if we've got it. You can also hide the chat box by clicking the little arrow button in the upper right uh, kind of area of the chat box if it's too distracting. In order to keep things moving, we don't intend to respond to much activity in the chat, so please be sure to submit um, any questions using that ask a question function. Um, we'll see how, how things uh, go, depending on, um, on how many questions there are in the chat box, you know, that's, that's, how, that's how we'll go about uh, uh, doing things and not Wow, did I just totally garble that chat box? I think without any further chat from me about how we'll be responding to things, let's move into introductions, shall we? I got you, Kate. Thanks. Depending on time. That's um, it. <laughs> uh, hi, folks. Uh, my name is Nusha, and my pronouns are they, them, and I am a co-community organizer for Disability Without Poverty, BC, with Kate. Um, I identify as a brown, genderqueer spoonie, and I'm joining you today as an uninvited settler on the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations, colonially known as Vancouver's North Shore. Over the last 10 years, I, or not the last 10 years, but for over 10 years, I've worked alongside women, youth, and cutie BIPOC who identify as neurodivergent, drug users, sex workers, with experiences of poverty, gender-based violence, and institutionalization. I believe agency comes from solidarity and the sharing of knowledge and skills. Witnessing an endless revolving door of folks needing and wanting access to support and resources, I realized that that would only continue and is only continuing and wanted to break the cycle. So I've shifted my focus from direct services to policy related work for structural change. Um, when I'm not building a movement with disability without poverty, I enjoy snuggling my dog Mishki who is blind, caring for houseplants, watercolor painting, and uh, I am also a peer researcher at an organization in BC called Health Justice, where we are currently working to reshape BC's Mental Health Act. Over to you, Kate. Good to meet you, Nisha. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Kate Fish, and I use she, her pronouns, and I identify as a fat, queer, and disabled person. And I'm also a registered social worker. I'm joining you today from the Comox First Nations territory, where they have been the caretakers of what they call the land of plenty since the time immemorial to present day. The area is known as the Comox Valley on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. I spent, similar to Nusha, around the last 10 years or so, uh, supporting and advocating with folks on issues related to HIV and Hep C, toxic drug supply and overdose, housing, poverty, and sexual health. Recently, I've been doing more online work uh, related to fat activism and community building. And in my spare time, uh, I enjoy reading quite a bit. Um, I enjoy reading in particular graphic novels and sometimes um, learning how to draw graphic novels and comics. Um, I really like to cook, garden, and I like to play computer games. So that's a bit about us as a team. Let's, uh, let's get right into it. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to 
who Disability Without Poverty is. What is our movement? Um, Disability Without Poverty formed in 2020 in response to the throne speech from Federal Minister of Employment, Workforce Development, and Disability Inclusion, Carla Qualtro. Uh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> and um, she committed to establishing the Canada Disability Benefit, which was introduced in the uh, Disability Action Inclusion Plan back in 2019. This commitment was reaffirmed in Minister Qualtro's mandate letter and in the May 2021 federal budget. There wasn't much information behind the promise of this benefit other than the goal of having it modeled after the guaranteed income supplement for seniors, which is stacked on top of old age security payment, payments. So based on that, we'd be looking at a stacking benefit on top of existing benefits that disabled Canadians currently receive, which is quite low below the poverty line. Leaders in the disability community knew that it was time for action and that ending disability poverty is an act of love and justice. Every Canadian, regardless of disability, should be able to afford the basic essentials of life and to enthusiastically participate in society without financial, physical or social barriers. Canada, and like we know, Canada has the resources, which we'll talk about later, <laughs> to end disability poverty, as demonstrated by other targeted benefits for children and seniors. We know that breakthroughs happen during periods of social upheaval, and COVID-19 really exposed the discrimination and in inequities people with disabilities experience, particularly in regards to accessing financial resources, which we're going to talk about more shortly. Um, and we know also that 22% of Canadians and 24% of British Columbians are disabled and they are disproportionately living in poverty. Nationally, disabled people represent 41% of those living below the poverty line. But that's a lot of people. Um, and, you know, we really do have more power than we think, especially when we team up with our allies to mobilize and create change. So really, this is a movement to galvanize and bring us together to make change happen. Um, Disability Without Poverty is led by people with disabilities from across the country, from Newfoundland, New Newfoundland and Labrador to Nunavut and to Kate and I here on the BC coast. So let's talk a bit about us over here on the west coast of Canada. Um, we so Nusha and I, although this is a uh, disability without poverty is a national movement, uh, Nusha and I are focused um, here in British Columbia. So work and conversations related to getting disability without poverty going specifically in BC had been happening for some time, even before that 2020. Um, speech from uh, Minister Qualtro. And there are many people in BC who have been involved in planning and organizing around disability and poverty for some time. Thanks to that work, um, we were able to receive funding from the Vancouver Foundation and uh, various provincial disability groups for Nusha and I's positions. And our role is to focus on uh, the provincial needs around disability and poverty and to draw on the provincial context. So some of the provincial context that we think about that, um, that inform the British Columbia reality include things like disability not being mentioned at all, not even the word disability showed up in the most recent BC budget. In 1996, BC became the first province in Canada to close all of its large institutions for people with intellectual disabilities. The Highway of Tears, an area in Northwest BC where many mostly indigenous young women have been taken or murdered. Deep poverty and disability is concentrated in Vancouver's downtown east side neighborhood. And finally, Vancouver hosted the Olympics in 2010, which caused major displacement and gentrification in the area, in, as well as surveillance um, in kind of a, a concentrated area, including the downtown east side. But it also caused ripple effects throughout the province that we still actually deal with today. So 
these examples highlight the intersections as well of disability, colonization, gender-based violence, and poverty. And so Nusha and I's goals are to build relationships um, and uh, to really build movement and support for the Canada disability benefit from the public and advocate for meaningful input from people with lived experience in the Canada disability benefit design and implementation. Now, what, tell us more about, about you know, kind of the, the money side of things, Nusha. Let's talk dollars and cents. Um, being disabled is so expensive. It's more expensive to live as a disabled person, which you have no choice about, <laughs> than to be a non-disabled person. Um, research from Australia said that the extra cost of disability is estimated on average at 37% higher than non-disabled people. Research in the UK said that extra cost of disability is estimated on average at 62% higher than non-disabled people. So this is due to uh, what's commonly referred to as the disability tax or in the disability justice community, some use the term CRIP tax. And this refers to all the extra costs disabled people might have depending on their disability and how severe it is. So here, here's a, a non-exhaustive list, just some examples of um, the things that non-disabled folks don't tend to think about um, and how that's related to extra costs. So things like therapies, equipments, and medications might not be covered or covered completely. So things like catheters, yes, some people do need to pay in order to pee. Um, breathing equipment, therapy with a counselor, a modified van, which I believe can be on average like $40,000 to modify a van. And that's not including the cost of the van, right? Um, things like an insulin uh, pump and then things like accessible housing, you know, are there stairs, elevators? Um, is it a smoking building? Um, is it wheelchair friendly enough so that doorways are high enough and layout is more open and accessible to um, wheelchairs and other mobility devices? Um, things like community aids and devices, specialized technology, transportation and mobility devices, um, personal care and support workers, and nutritional needs such as pre-cut food or prepared food. Um, food and grocery delivery, and all of these things, which is, you know, just some of many, uh, is, is, um, uh, so this non-exhaustive list uh, makes it really challenging to not only meet basic costs of living, um, but also the disability tax or crib tax. And this doesn't include costs such as clothing, entertainment, or leisure. Um, so what, is, what does it look like across the country, Kate? I'm really enjoying the, uh, like, <laughs> I think we should have a newscast. It's feeling very <laughs> newscasty and I like it very much. Um, so, Let's get into it. So just a reminder, again, like Nusha said, 22% of Canadians are disabled and are disproportionately living in poverty. Nationally, disabled people represent 41% of those living below the poverty line. And keep in mind that in the last year, inflation has uh, hit 7.7% federally. And here in BC, we're actually above the national average at an inflation rate of 8.1%. In Canada, the poverty line, which I've noted on here, I've called it the poverty line, but I just want to explain that a bit more. So in Canada, the poverty line is determined by what's called the market basket measure. The, and I'm going to call that the MBM, um, if that's okay with you. I'll, I'll, I'll do the full phrase from time to time to make sure uh, we remember, but that's what I'm going to go with. Um, so the MBM is based on the cost of a specific basket of what's considered to be kind of essential goods and services representing a modest basic standard of living. It includes the costs of food, clothing, shelter, transportation, 
and other items for a reference family of two adults and two children. But it's very important to note that the MBM does not account for higher costs associated with disability that we reviewed uh, just a minute ago um, or the fluctuations in inflation. So we've done a calculation to scale the amount uh, for one person uh, rather than a family of four. And the map shows numbers for a single adult who receives disability assistance contrasted to the provincial poverty line. There's no poverty line, um, there's no, uh, sorry, no poverty measurement for the Northern Territories. Again, as many of the items considered necessary and essential in the market mass basket measure are actually not even available in those Northern areas. And this is further exacerbated if you're disabled. In Saskatchewan, there's variety actually in how much the disability rates are. It varies by region from $931 to $1,064. New Brunswick doesn't even actually have a specific disability benefit, rather just a one rate social assistance amount of $571. So this is just to give you a bit of a snapshot of the level of poverty experienced uh, by disabled people across Canada. It's good to get kind of the, the macro view, even if it's just a few provinces to see um, where things are at. But because we're BC and we're focused on BC, let's take a quick, quick look at that as well. So um, in BC, income or disability assistance is um, operated as an income of last resort. So they want you to have exhausted all of your potential assets um, and other avenues of money before um, providing with income assistance or, sorry, not income assistance, disability assistance. And it's um, administered by what's called the Ministry of Poverty Reduction, or no, Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction or MSDPR, I'll put that, uh, Nisha, if you wanna put that in the chat, that would be great. But we'll maybe just call it the ministry because um, that's generally the one we're referring to. And so like the previous map, we're showing that the poverty line differs according to population size across the province. In the past, and this is what has come up the most, I've lived rurally most of my life, and this comes up a lot. In the past, people would be encouraged to move to more rural and remote uh, areas of the province for a lower cost of living. But as you can see, even when you move out of the city, the poverty line doesn't lower enough to meet the provincial disability benefit amount. This is important to keep in mind for those who do not live in urban areas, as many goods and services are not available and the cost of transportation is much higher to even get the goods and services closest to them. Um, and you'll see that there's not a, a humongous uh, difference between the different areas, just a few hundred dollars uh, difference um, in terms of the poverty line. So let's let's um, hear a little bit about the pandemic response. That's that's something that uh, we can we can all uh, think about financially. I think it impacted everybody, but especially for people with disabilities. Absolutely. Um, so again, um, this isn't an exhaustive list of programs, but the ones um, most impacted by disabled people, regardless of their el eligibility. So non-disabled people really didn't have to jump. Uh, uh, non-disabled people in Canada really didn't have to jump through hoops and prove their needs for income support during the pandemic. Um, this was most evident with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or what I'll refer to as CERB, moving forward. And this was available to workers that were over 15 years old, who stopped working because of COVID-19 related reasons, or were eligible for employment insurance benefits or had exhausted them. Eligibility to receive CERB required an income of at least $5,000, um, in the last, uh, in 2019 or the last 12 months. And this was restricted to people who did not quit their job voluntarily. Disability benefits here in BC did not count toward the income requirement. So disabled folks were 
ineligible, so not eligible for SERP. Um, SERP ended late in September 2020 and transitioned to the Canada Recovery Benefit, which was similarly tied to the previous earnings like SERP. This was provided over the course of 54 weeks, calculated at $500 per week, with amounts reduced in the final 12 weeks. This benefit ended in October 2021. Through both of these major federal programs, disabled people were not considered. Um, watching the government make the funds available within 10 days of applying for the program and at a rate well above disability benefits across the country was devastating. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> like I think about it and it's like, it is devastating, truly, I laugh. I laugh so I don't cry. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it was truly devastating. Um, and this was all while disabled people were already facing um, such a high burden of risk and isolation during the pandemic. And many non-disabled uh, Canadians receiving CERB were quite vocal and active about how they were struggling to get by on just the $2,000 per month that they were receiving through CERB. And this was all without the added costs of being disabled. So the CRIP tax that we talked about earlier. Um, people in BC then had their federal benefits exempt temporarily. Uh, the payments were fully exempt for three months. So people receiving income benefits, or sorry, income assistance and disability assistance in BC could access a small amount of COVID-19 benefits without any reductions to their monthly assistance pro uh, payments. So remember the annual earnings exemption is $15,000 per year for folks, uh, people with disabilities in BC. So anything that was received or made, um, any income above that was clawed back. Um, for everyone who was not eligible for the federal support programs. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. <laughs> um, just for folks who may have not seen Kate put in the chat. It's a lot. Let's take a deep breath, <laughs> which I really appreciate. So thank you. Um, so for folks who were not eligible for the federal support programs, um, the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction provided an automatic $300 monthly COVID-19 crisis supplement for the following three months. This supplement was also provided to low-income seniors who received the BC Seniors Supplement and recipients of income assistance or disability assistance who reside in special care facilities. Then in December 2020, a one-time BC recovery benefit was issued where a single person received $500 and families under income thresholds received $1,000. Um, and at the same time, the supplemental COVID-19 benefit was clawed back for people receiving income and disability assistance, leaving people with a $150 supplement after many months of receiving $300. People were, again, devastated. The $300 had met access to food, PPE, medications, and paying bills that previously weren't able to be afforded, uh, that folks couldn't previously afford. And then having that reduced to half meant, uh, meant um, that many people, uh, many disabled people were left struggling. And many considered this uh, reduction absolutely inhumane. And, you know, the pandemic, I think, really highlighted um, the, the experiences that disabled folks have been, ex uh, have been dealing with for, for years and years, right? Um, the, the situation was already dire and the pandemic just really heightened that. And it was during this time that um, people learned about what, what folks uh, with disabilities were, were struggling with. And it was shocking to non-disabled people that folks with disabilities were essentially, you know, receiving half of what they were getting on CERB. Um, so... Well, I'll be more exact. It, it, 
receiving $1,358 per month, uh, which was actually less before the pandemic. Um, but not enough to, to make some, some real difference. Because let's remember that the Canada Disability Benefit was introduced to lift people, uh, disabled people out of poverty, right? It's not about getting them just to the line, it's about um, pulling them out. Um, so in, in recommend- Should we maybe bump along to the, the next slide? Let's talk a bit more about the Canada Disability Benefit. Yeah, now. let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks. Great, totally. awesome. <laughs> um, so needless to say, lots was going on with the pandemic response, but people with disabilities were left behind and that made the Canada Disability Benefit all the more important. So initial um, uh, surveying around the Canada Disability Benefit um, was uh, uh, found that 89% of Canadians were in favor of a Canada Disability Benefit because 57% uh, said that it's the right thing to do. And 59% said that they supported it because the current levels of support are inadequate. Um, both, I think, we have demonstrated um, already here. Nusha gave a brief history of how the Canada Disability Benefit was introduced by the Liberals a few years ago. Um, and we don't have a ton of details um, or confirmed information because things are still being worked out. What we do know is that it would be a monthly benefit a federal monthly benefit, but we don't know things like how much um, or the, the process for eligibility or access. What we believe is at the very least, people must be able to meet the poverty line, but we know that the added costs of being disabled means that it actually needs to be above the poverty line. Um, so those are some things to consider. And I think that, um, I'll talk just quickly about um, the current state too. So right now um, in June, actually, there's been a ton of movement for the Canada Disability Benefit as it was retabled because it was initially tabled um, before the last Canada election. And, um, and then after the election, it kind of fell off the table. So it was retabled um, on uh, at the beginning of the month. And then um, on June 2nd, the bill was officially reintroduced and the first reading was completed. And then on June 23rd, um, you know, after that first reading has been done, it still needs to go through more steps to actually, um, for the Canada Disability Benefit to come into law. But we have to actually wait till September because the House of Commons is on uh, summer vacation till the end of September. So things are kind of um, on hold a bit with, with um, moving things through. Um, but those are some of the pieces that we, we, we know about for the Canada Disability Benefit. But let's talk about what we're hoping to see as Disability Without Poverty. Well, and I, I was also going to say um, for folks who are interested on the process of how a bill becomes law, um, we did have an event uh, and it, I think it was recorded. So feel free to uh, send us an email. Um, Kate, maybe you can put that in the chat um, if you want to stay up to date with what we're doing and, and learn about uh, how a bill becomes law as well. Um, so what should the benefit look like? So we think that the benefit itself needs to at least meet the poverty line. Um, and it needs to be meaningfully informed by folks with disabilities, particularly those who are experiencing poverty. Um, we need it implemented as soon as possible. Uh, we know that people are people are hardly surviving, right? Like, and I think when we were talking about things like MAID, so medi medical assistance and dying, people are choosing or, you know, coerced into um, dying because they cannot afford to live uh, due to their costs of being financial, uh, due to the financial costs of being disabled. 
So um, we, again, yeah, acknowledging the extra costs associated with disability, so that CRIP tax again, um, having uh, eligibility and application process be simplified and easily accessible, uh, to have a generous earnings e exemption, um, for it to be indexed to the disability costs of living, so not just basic costs of living across the board, but for the needs of disabled folks, um, and to have it be established as an individual benefit. So not having your benefits cut because you are living with a partner or married. Currently folks are, uh, they are choosing again <laughs> um, to not live with their partner or to divorce because they receive less benefits as a result because the expectation is that spouse is supposed to support you financially as a disabled person. Um, and yeah, we could talk endlessly about that. Uh, but yes, uh, and and the and one of the most important things as well. I mean, these are all very important, but uh, no clawbacks um, of financial or in kind benefits. So we certainly do not have all the answers. This is just where we at, where we're at right now, and uh, we will be informed by people as we continue to connect with them because we need to you know determine we need to ensure that this benefit is is accessible to as many people as possible and that requires really key um, consultations with people with lived experience um, and yeah this is uh, this is the stance we're at uh, right now, and we're doing our best to get the voices to government. And this is all very much still in progress. Mm -hmm. But you were speaking there, Nusha, to that meaningful participation piece. Mm -hmm. So the government needs to, so like we we are an advocacy, um, you know, movement group, um, um, making sure that those voices make their way up to government to inform things. but. The government also needs to take action and make sure that they um, they provide opportunity for meaningful participation. And participation is meaningful when the time, energy, and lived experience uh, someone has provided is actually used to make the program better for the people that it serves. The opposite is lip service. So when you use someone's time and energy and get people's hopes up and then don't actually use it, that breaks trust and relationship and it doesn't make the program any better. Um, so people most impacted by the program need to provide input and guidance, uh, in particular for the candidate disability benefit for the amount, how much the amount should be, um, eligibility, as well as how the benefit will be accessed. Um, and we've heard, um, you know, a lot of those points right now align with what we've proposed as disability without poverty. But of course, everyone across the country and with different disabilities and, and situations will have their own perspective, which is important. Um, but also government systems are high barrier, particularly for people with lived and living experience to provide their expertise. Expecting people to conform to strict confines of government processes fails to capture diverse perspectives and it's ableist. In the case of the Canada Disability Benefit, again, participation is often not possible as a direct result of disability poverty. So some ways that, that the government can encourage meaningful participation is um, you know by accepting creative contributions. So maybe it's not just last minute focus groups or online surveys. They can provide information in advance, be transparent and flexible. And to build a movement, um, which is, is what we're um, uh, kind of encouraging and working with people to do, which kind of feeds up to um, uh, engaging potentially with, um, with folks who are closer to decision makers or decision makers, um, these are some, some things that people can do to make their voices heard. So, you know, writing to or meeting with their member of parliament, we've had lots of people do that and it can be really effective. Uh, signing petitions to the government. We did one earlier this year and we got almost 18,000 signatures in support for the Canada Disability Benefit. Um, 
uh, social media, connecting with peer advocates like us who can pass things along, um, joining action committees or communities, uh, attending webinars and staying informed. There's lots of ways to be a part of things. Nusha, over to you. Um, so let's talk about uh, the Canada Disability Benefit and basic income. How do they compare? Um, so, you know, I think a lot of folks ask, should the Canada Disability Benefit be designed as a basic income? Um, it's, it's funny because I think they're often seen in opposition, but it's not actually true. Like, uh, there is a shared focus and goal of reducing poverty. Um, you know, the principles of basic income is for simplicity, respect, economic security, and social inclusion. And, um, there is a specific need for folks to have a Canada disability benefit, uh, as a, as a supplement, right, as an income supplement. So while I think the benefit can serve as a great example of, of, a, of a basic income, I don't think it should replace the benefits um, because this would then not take into consideration the extra costs of being disabled, the extra costs of living um, uh, as a disabled person. Um, so I think the design and implementation of the Canada Disability Benefit will really dictate how aligned it actually is with basic income principles. Um, we know that income supplements already exist for children and seniors and a targeted disability benefit is long, has been long overdue. And people should still have access to that basic income or not. And being that the Canada Disability Benefit is the closest thing right now to the basic income program. I think passing it is really good for the basic income movement as a whole, because we definitely believe in that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, let's, um, Let's go ahead and um, move over to questions, maybe, Nusha. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be great. This is how. Thanks for being mindful of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you uh, for hearing our presentation, everyone. This is a bit of information um, on how you can get in touch with us and stay in touch with us. Um, we would love that very much. And let's take a look at some questions. So, um, one of the questions here is why only working age folks? Really good question. <laughs> and I think um, what I understand is that after 64, people receive another uh, benefit, so the benefits transition. Um, and before, um, uh, in the younger age group, there's the child uh canada canadian child benefit but um uh i i i think that there should be um you know seniors poverty is still an issue so um there's definitely lots of calls for the benefit to not have that upper age limit um but in terms of specifics in terms of why only working age it's a a, a working age benefit. Um, I, I'd get you some more information on that. Unless, Nusha, you have anything uh, to add to that. No, I just think it's one of those things where money is always an issue. It's all about budget, right? So if there are other supplements um, that can be used for different populations, then, you know, that that already exists. But, you know, we know, as we talked about earlier, that those benefits are not taking into consideration the needs of disabled people, regardless of age. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, okay. And the next question is, um, have people with disabilities been involved in designing the benefit so far? And the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> they have, they have been. Um, so, um, there's the Disability Inclusion Action Plan, and along with that, there is a, a committee of people who have been informing 
um, and collaborating with the government on some of the key decision making. Um, and certainly providing, there are many groups that are providing um, uh, input and consultation, but also um, just recently um, uh, they rolled out some focus groups. So for instance, like Nusha and I ran a focus group with folks in BC on what they thought should happen for the Canada Disability Benefit and that information um, will go towards um, informing informing uh, the benefits creation. Nusha, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I would say that like, um, it's kind of a combination right now. So, uh, you know, the government has contracted several disability organizations to focus on four different pillars of the disability action inclusion plan. Uh, the financial security was done, for example, by Inclusion Canada. So they were doing stuff like the focus groups and they reached out to organizations such as ours to be able to um, run those. But that alone is like not sufficient, obviously, right? Because that's contracted by the government. And so, you know, Disability Without Poverty is really a grassroots movement. So we try to do as much as we can. And uh, right now in BC, we're um, about to start developing our steering committee so that the provincial needs um, can be represented nationally um, in, in our movement. And um, so it's, I mean, it's an ongoing process. It's never start and done. The idea is that the movement will continue uh, even after this uh, benefit is developed and implemented. This is really just the, the beginning of, of a long movement that, well, it's not the beginning, it's a continuation of a long movement um, and, and is intended to uh, continue after the fact, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, yes, so long story short, um, yes, there has been involvement of people with disabilities um, at the government level, to what degree and what community and things like that, um, what intersections they hold that might uh, um, be up for question, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but um, but we'll continue to make sure that we're, we bring those voices to the table as much as we can as a non-government group. Yeah. Any I other questions? Wow. Okay. Um, please put an emoji in the chat if you think Nusha and I should have a disability poverty uh, <laughs> news anchor. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> You've got at least one. All right. Um, we're getting the, the wrap up uh, from uh, the big conference. So um, I'll read. All I forgot that I actually have an outro. Oh, my goodness outro. Here we go. So thank you everybody for attending this session. A recording of this session will be available when this broadcast ends using the same link uh, to register and join this session. Join the afternoon plenary, Politics of the Basic Income, the Strategy of Winning National Policy, where policy strategists will discuss how we move towards comprehensive direct cash policy at a federal level. I'll be interested in that one. Um, then we will be closing up this year's conference with the plenary Rethinking Basic Income, Challenges to Universality and Uniformity of Payment, followed by closing remarks. Also a good one. I think I might show up for both of those. And finally, celebrate the end of the 20th annual big conference with a social hour in Kumo space, where we can continue the conversation with other conference attendees and speakers. Check out the conference website for full schedule and additional information. And um, all of our information is in uh, the chat there. Nusha has uh, posted it. And um, I'm just going to, oh yeah, it's all there. And uh, Tom in Victoria, please reach out. I'm just up island. If you've got stuff uh, 
uh, stuff you're thinking of. Um, it'd be great to connect. And thanks everybody so much for being uh, fantastic today. So gonna... Thank you so much. It was really mm -hmm. wonderful to, to be here with all of you. Thanks for everyone who joined and for your questions. Toodaloo.